Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I, I'm only here for this week, so I missed the summer school. I heard there are many excellent summer school talks. So let me take the liberty of using the first part of my talk to give a crash course on a beginning differential. So uh, a beginning differential defined on the Riemann surface is nothing but a holomorphic manifold. So locally, away from the zeros of the differential omega, you can choose some suitable local coordinate z, write omega as d of z. Then if you think of this z as a standard coordinate in the Euclidean plane, then you can use it to induce a flat metric by writing z at x plus i times y, where x and y are the horizontal and vertical coordinates. So what happens at the zeros of omega? Well, so I'd like to specify the zero order. So suppose you have a zero of order one inch order m. Again, you choose some local suitable coordinate. You write omega d of z raised to m plus first. And if you, if you write it this way, and then think of the nearby in the metric, so locally at this zero, you should glue m plus one copies of flat disks consecutively so that as a center, you will get a saddle point, a cone point, which is a singularity under the flat metric of total angle given by the exponent n plus 1, which is a 0 order plus 1 times 2 pi. So let me show you the following picture. Suppose you want to describe a saddle point of angle 2 pi times k, where k is an <coughs> integer bigger than 1. So what you can do, you can just take 2k half disks and label the edges, the region of the half disks, as what I did in the picture. So we start from the left one. A1 goes to B1, B1 goes to A2, A2 goes to B2, and continue. The last one goes back to A1 to A1. So after gluing these edges, the centers of all these half disks are identified to be the same point. And you still get the underlying smooth Riemann surface but the center, because the total angle is 2 pi times k, as long as k is bigger than 1, <coughs> so you get a saddle point. Let's look at some global examples. So if you have genes 1, then you get an everywhere flat torus by gluing the two parallel edges of a parallelogram. Okay? So there is no special singularity or cone point on a flat torus. If you go to higher genus, you are necessarily wrong into uh, set of points. So here's an octagon with four pairs of parallel edges labeled by vi and vi. Now if you identify vi with vi by translation, and you get a closed surface. And you can further check that all the eight vertices are identified to be the same point. And for the octagon, the total angle is 6 pi, right? So if you run the formula I told you, I guess for now you have seen many times at this conference, so 6 pi is 2 pi times 2 plus 1. So this is your vanishing order. That tells you you get a double 0 for the resulting abelian differential <coughs> at the vertex. And if you have a genus 2 Riemann surface, <coughs> besides having a double zero, I mean, pick a general differential, you would expect to have two isolated simple zeros. Right? So you can also do such an example by using, say, a Decker gun with five pairs of parallel edges. But now the things, you see, if you do the gluing A to A, B to B, etc., the 10 vertices break into two groups labeled by the different color. The vertices of the same color will become the same set of point. And now you check the total angle at, say, the blue point. You'll get only 4 pi. And 4 pi is 2 pi times 1 plus 1. That tells you the resulting differential will have a simple 0 as the blue point. Similarly, it will have another simple 0 as a red point. So that gives you a mean differential with two simple zeros on a genus 2 Riemann surface.
Um, any questions? Okay, so we'd like to put abelian differentials of similar structure to a parameter space called the strata of differentials. Suppose the underlying Riemann surface is of genus G. Then I'd like to fix a partition m1 to mn. These are n positive integers that sum up to 2g minus 2. OK? So let's call this partition as a signature mu. So let's define first, as a set, the space of abelian differentials of type mu just given by this h mu consisting of pairs of uh, underlying Riemann surface of genus G along with the abelian differential omega of type mu in the sense that omega has exactly n distinct zeros and each zero zi is of the specified order mi. Okay. So, so far this looks like only a set. And if you further take the uni of all these h mu, regardless of the zero type, in other words, just consider all possible genus G Riemann surfaces along with all possible abelian differentials, then you just recover the so-called rank G Hart bundle sitting above the moduli space mg of genus G Riemann surfaces. In other words, the uni of this strata is a pretty nice space. It's like a vector bundle of rank G over mg. Well, nevertheless, each space, h mu itself, also has a nice geometric structure coming from the period coordinates. Okay. So I can mark my Riemann surface x using the n zeros of differential. I take a basis of the relative homology. And the rank of this relative homology is a two time genus, which comes from uh, the absolute homology plus n minus 1, where n is the number of zeros. For example, I can just connect z1, z2, z3, up to z n minus 1, all to the n, I get n minus 1 additional relative path. This gives me the additional basis in the relative homology. And now you can do it very simple. You just take your one form, omega in the strata, integrate it against this basis, comma i. Okay? Then you just get 2g plus n minus 1, complex numbers. The claim is that this 2g plus n minus 1 complex number gives you the local coordinate system of the stratum h mu. So that if you buy this argument, immediately it follows this strata looks like uh, locally a uh, 2g plus n minus 1 complex dimensional um, manifold, or orbifold if you prefer. And the underlying reason why this 2g plus n minus 1 period give you the local coordinate, you can think of as uh, think of them as uh, edges of the polygon presentation. Let's go back. And so these three i's are indeed the integral of omega against the basis of uh, homology. In this case, if you just perturb this vi a little bit, it changes the shape, the size of the polygon a little bit. It preserves all the uh, st discrete invariant we fixed, for example, the number of vertices, the number of edges, and the way how they glue together. So you s remain the same strata. You just perturb your abelian differential a little bit in the neighborhood so that these VIs do behave like a local coordinates of the strata. OK, so as a consequence, it's quite easy to remember now the complex dimension of the strata. It's just given by the rank of this relative homology, two times genus plus number of zero minus one. Well, nevertheless, sometimes if you have a very special signature mu, this space, h mu, could be disconnected. Um, I mean, it's not too much disconnected in the sense that it can have at most up to three connected components. And if there are more than one connected component, so there must be some extra structure for those additional components coming from two types. One is called hyperliptic. Usually it just means the underlying um, surface is hyperliptic. And either you have a rather point as a unique zero, or you have two, a pair of conjugate, hyperliptic conjugate points. 
So that gives you hybrid components. Or you may have a spin structure. For example, all the zero have even order. You divide it by one half, you get a so-called um, either spin structure, if you know what it is. If you are more algebraic, then that is a theta characteristic. Or half kinetic divisor, you can look at the parity. Okay. So that distinguishes additional structure. So, so there is this very famous result by Kansevich and Zorich, which classified completely all connected components for all strata HMU. Okay. So from now on, just for 10 minutes of my notation, whenever I speak of a strata, I actually mean a strata component. Okay. I'll just keep saying strata, but the word I actually mean because I only want to deal with connected space. I will say just strata means a strata component if there is a more than one component. Um, I guess to many of you, especially who work in dynamics, so the key player in the game is this GL2 action on the strata HMU. So the action itself is quite simple. You just take, well, uh, two by two, non-singular matrix, and acting on the strata by linear transformation. Again, you take this polygon picture and put it in the Euclidean plane, and you take a two by two singular matrix, and acting on the edges, it again changes the shape or the size of the polygon. But it remains in the same strata. You see this octagon still remains to be octagon with four pairs of parallel edges. If you glue together, you still get the same zero of the same order. This really acts on each strata, not only on the total space of the Hodge bundle. So the induced GL2 action is sometimes called tech mirror dynamics, which is a part of the title of the conference, because I think it has some connection, I guess many connections to mirror theory and so on and so forth. Um, so the central question, I guess, in tech mirror dynamics is to study orbit of the GL2 action. Well, there are, I guess, too many good results to mention. So let me just selectively say like, <coughs> very few like, uh, classical results about it. <coughs> so, so due to Maser and uh, also which, if you pick a general point in the strata HMU, OK, you pick a general point, and you look at its orbit closure, so here, when I say take the orbit closure, it may be quite obvious to you under what topology. So under the topology induced by the period coordinates. Um, well, if you do this, for the general differential in the strata, this orbit closure turns out to be the entire strata. In other words, it has sort of equidistributional uh, behavior. However, if you take a special differential in the strata, and sometimes the orbit closure could be only a subspace. You don't recover the whole strata. And for example, I said the strata, I mean, they form the Hodge bundle over the modular space Mg of genus G Riemann surfaces. You can project an orbit closure, or just even orbit, to Mg. So forget the differential, look at the underlying Riemann surface only, and project to the modular space genus G curves. Um, Sometimes, if an orbit projection, even before it takes a closure in Mg, forms a complex curve that is also forms the Riemann surface itself, then this is very special. So we call them a tech mirror curve. And tech mirror curves um, certainly exist, and there are tons of them. If you don't only consider primitive tech mirror curves. For example, the standard construction of tech mirror curves comes from branch covers of tau i branched over a unique branch point. So the construction just can be explained using a single picture. So this is, uh, on the left-hand side, I have a unit square with a standard unit tor torus. Tau Yeah. So I, I have a very stupid question. So people often say, OK, here are these special square tiles. So yeah. Is it easy to write down an actual generic thing where the orbit closure is everything? Like, here's some actual numbers. Here's the shapes. This thing is generic. What do you mean? So, the surfaces are not generic. 
Yeah, exactly. So your first <coughs> examples are, most things are generic. Well, I so guess, for example, in, for example, in genus 2, I mean, due to, I guess, classic result of Kurt, you already know, like, so special, so, so special one. Just write down a flex surface to avoid those special ones. So write down anything else, yeah. Yeah, except, yeah. If you know the classification of the special object closure, then you know what general one means. But in general, we don't know the classification of all special object closures. If you write down one, most of the chance you'll get a general one, but you still have to do a little work. Does it make sense? I'm thinking that the um, special ones are all defined over number fields. Yeah. So maybe you can. Okay. If you can check. Yeah. Yeah. If you can check your. So I just put in some e's and pi's in the side lengths, and then I'm good. Yes. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be careful. You can be in the covering of uh, something else. And it's still some e and pi somewhere. If you have enough independence. Yeah. I just want to see an example. Yeah. Of one generic. <laughs> <laughs> I think your so your question makes sense, but you know most people they like to see example of special one, but you are looking for example of general one, which makes sense. Okay. Summarize the discussion. What was the first thing you said? Generic. Generic. Yeah. Generic. Yeah. 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 Yeah is a host data, it's not a special recruiter. And Kurt and other people answered, for example, you can rely on um, this asking Mirza Hani, Mohammadi, and the Simeon Philip result, which I'm going to mention in a second. S any such special orbit closures must come defined over a number field. If you throw in some transcendental numbers, make sure there's no like, uh, arithmetic relation, then you are safe to get a general. Does this answer your question? Yeah. Any further comments? I'll come back to this point later, soon, when I mention this uh, result, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so I guess I was in the middle of describing this branch cover construction. So this extra certainly is a special one, okay? Because, yeah. So this is a branch cover, so where tau surfaces. So you have five squares on the left. So this indeed, if you glue the edges appropriately, you get a genus 2 degree 5 branch cover of this standard torus. Now you apply this GL2 action. It, it is exchangeable with the GL2 action on the torus first. You can change the shape of the square to another parallelogram. So you still take five copies of the parallelogram on the right. You glue it in the same way. You form another branch cover of the same type. And you can just lift your form dz via this branch cover to the covering surface. And if you choose suitable ramification over the branch point, you get into the desired, desired strata. And this DL2 action is extendable with this picture. And uh, you get uh, this special Tachymere curve. Or put it in an algebraic way, you get a special the Hori space of branch cover torus of complex one dimension if you mod C star. These are special tachymere curves called arithmetic tachymere curves. And if you want to go to higher dimension to mimic this construction, you can throw in more than one branch point. If you take your torus and consider n branch point, and again, you can get some higher dimensional Hurry space parameterizing or corresponding to this special gl 2 orbit closure arising from torus coverings. And I guess the harder part of the story is that there do exist other, maybe this is more rare, like special orbit closures that do not come from this current construction. And many, many people, including many people in the audience, have done a lot of work and, um, and found many, well, find like special, this uh, non current orbit closures. I guess later today, in Kurt's talk, he will tell us some exciting new examples of GL2 orbit closures. But the full classification of special orbit closures, I think, is still open. We don't have a complete list of uh, special orbit closures. Well, nevertheless, so this comes to the earlier question Saul asked me. So, so one fundamental result recently was the work by asking Murzahani Muhammadi. I mean, although we do not have a complete classification of orbit closures, now we do know a structural theorem. We do know 
locally how they look like. In the sense that they show that every object closure is a so-called R5 invariance of manifolds. In what sense? So here is this term R5. I guess to this audience really means a locally linear structure, like a locally a vector, like a space and uh, I mean subspace sitting inside a vector space, where you use the pure coordinates of your strata to be the local coordinates of a vector space. And then this term, I mean, very basic language says that locally this orbit closure is cut out by linear equations of pure coordinates of the ambient strata. Okay. So you have a local linear structure. So that's the term alpha, I guess, originally came from for this orbit closure. I mean, then later on, Simeon Phillips strengthened the result by showing that you can actually replace these real coefficients in the defining equation of alpha numerous submanifold by algebraic numbers. So that Kurt already mentioned, these special orbit closures, they actually they are algebraic. They define over a number field. So they are algebraic variety. So here, that's why I made the earlier remark. Previously, I said when you take the orbit closure, it's you took it under the analytic topology because period coordinates are sort of transcendental. But I'm not average geometer, so if I were facing an average geometry audience, I would say, okay, this certainly differs from taking the Zariski topology. If you take the Zariski topology closure, they automatically got something as your brick. So you don't have to say anything about the theorem, except that they define over number field. Okay. But anyway, so these are very fundamental results, very useful nowadays. Okay, so I finished the crash course on ability differentials. <laughs> I mean, this is the easy part for you of my talk. Any questions? Uh, before I go to the second part of my talk, so let me just add two remarks. So I will exchange my language between uh, Riemann surfaces and uh, complex algebraic curves. And to me, they are more or less the same thing. But for the second part of the talk, it's easier to say a, a curve, which means a complex curve, real two dimension. Okay. For example, if you say a tachymeter curve, you mean well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's complex one dimension, okay. real two dimension. And also, often I would consider differentials up to scaling. I want to modulate this actual C star action. That means I often consider projectivized strata or projectivized uh, heart bundle. Okay. It does not make much difference just for convenience. Okay. All right. And I will also abuse my language when I say alpha inverse and manifolds. Sometimes it means in the projectivized strata, modular system. Okay. For example, tachymeric curves okay, is only complex one dimensional, but I would also say it is alpha inverse and manifolds. Okay. All right, so let me again take the liberty of giving my second part of the talk as a crash course on algebraic geometry. <laughs> so let me start from the very beginning. Well, maybe another remark. Since I'm in France, this is only the classical algebraic geometry before Grossendieck. <laughs> no schemes involved. So algebraic geometry, while well, studies so-called algebraic varieties, these are quite well, I mean, simple objects, because locally you can look at them as a solution space of a set of polynomials with complex coefficient. Let's just study complex algebra geometry, okay? So often you only want to study those varieties that sit inside the projected space. Those are called projective variety, okay? That is some algebra varieties contained in a projective space, CPN, okay? the n-dimensional complex project space, okay? For example, CP1 is nothing but the Riemann sphere. Well, I mean, so here is a very basic but maybe an interesting example to some of you if you never studied or heard anything about L geometry. I take this CP2, okay, with homogeneous coordinates x, y, z. So P2 is a two-dimensional complex surface, the project plane. I use alpha, sorry, I use a homogeneous current x, y, z to describe a polynomial y squared minus x, z. It's a homogeneous polynomial. I look at the vanishing locus, okay? I claim, in this case, y squared minus x, z, the zero locus, 
actually gives you a projective algebraic curve, which is the Riemann surface of genus zero. In other words, I get this another description of the Riemann sphere as the vanishing locus of y squared minus xc sitting inside the projective plane. So if you don't believe me, and if you don't want to do it as an exercise, let me tell you the answer directly. So this is very quick. So I take P1 with coordinate, so CP1 with coordinate given by U and V. I can map it to P2 by U square, U V, and V square. So this is P2. And you check this, this is x, this is y, this is z, so y squared equals x times z. Okay? And furthermore, you can check that this gives you the holomorphic map onto the image. So I have my p1 sits inside p2, but it's not linearly embedded. It's a bunch of locus of a quadratic equation. Okay, so let me bring up the other meaning of this affinity. So what is affine variety? Well, I, I describe it in this way. Uh, affine variety V, I write it as <coughs> x minus h. That is, x is a project variety. So x itself sits inside some big project space. What is h? So you have a project space, right? You have some co-dimensional one linear subspace, like pn minus 1 sits inside pn. So this co-dimensional one linear subspace, they are called hyperplane. So I take a hyperplane H. I just remove the hyperplane section H with X. Uh, look at the complement. The complement in X of this hyperplane section defines the affine variety. So you can take it as a definition of affine variety. So why do we study affine variety? Well, I mean, just as you study complex force, you want to describe like an like a open subset, like local charts that glue together to form a complex manifold. So in our geometry, you also want to describe under the Zarix topology, the local charts that are glued together to form an algebraic variety, or form a projective variety. Right? So here, affine varieties provide, in some sense, local charts that you glue together to form a projective variety. OK, so let me do another example. Again, so let's just take the Riemann sphere P1, but now I view it as a smooth algebraic curve of one dimensional. I have the coordinates U and V, right? If I do this as union, this big U, which is, the so U is not equal to zero, and union, the big V there, V is not equal to zero for these two homogeneous coordinates. Now think about this. This u isomorphic to one copy of c. This v is also isomorphic to one copy of c. Because if you have the first coordinate non-zero, because this is a homogeneous coordinate, you can just take v over u to be the coordinate for this chart u. Similarly here, you can take u over v to be the coordinate of v. So these are just two copies of the Athan plane or the standard complex plane. These are like special Athan varieties. You can glue these two together to form the global projective CP1. Okay. OK, so if you generalize this to higher dimension, for example, the n-dimensional vector space is an affine variety, because you can describe it as n-dimensional projective space minus a hyperplane. If you set one coordinate to be non-zero, then you get an open subset, which is isomorphic to CN. Okay. So CNs are affine variety. And, um, Another basic example, if you take a, say, a Riemann surface or the complex curve, see, you remove a non-empty set of finite many points. Okay, so remaining this punctured Riemann surface also gives you an affine variety. For example, if you, let me write on the other side. I take this as CP2. I take a, say, a torus or elliptic curve embedded inside CP2 as a plane cubic. And you can take a, this is AH, which is just a CP1 linearly inside CP2. I remove the three points. So I get a torus minus three points. So that is a affine variety. But in general, 
can generalize the punctured every curve always alpha in the sense that alpha variety. Okay, questions. Okay, so besides as a local providing local charts, alpha varieties themselves also have some simple structures. Do you require any transversality? No. So this is just one example. I could put the torus into some other space and then remove a different set of points, and even with more tracer, it doesn't matter. No, no, right. So not the number, but like if it was tangent, then you were looking at Good question. But I, what I meant is, OK, um, so why describe the, the, the last examples? I only remove those PIs as a set. Yeah. yeah, if I get tangency at a point, I still remove the point as one point. That's one point, okay. But if you are true geometry, you would say I remove a two times P as a divisor. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then you get uh, this hyperplane section, it's nothing but an ample divisor. So in other words, alpha variety just like projective variety minus an ample divisor. I don't want to invoke the term ample. I'm just writing down the real definition. <laughs> OK, any other questions? Well, this, this is a true statement. So statement still holds if I remove without multiplicity. OK, so well, one simple structure can be explained as follows. Suppose you have an alpha variety V. So I claim V itself cannot contain any complete algebraic curve. In other words, you cannot find, uh, say, a closed <laughs> Riemann surface itself. Sits inside an alpha variety. But clearly, if you have, like, a, say, alpha and vector space, Cn, you cannot find a closed Riemann surface sitting inside Cn, right? unless you remove some points from the Riemann surface. But then the Riemann surface is not complete. When I say complete, that means no puncture. It's really closed. Okay, that's the meaning of complete. <laughs> and in general, this also follows from the property of this hyperplane inside the project space. Let me describe this. Well, because if you had a complete curve contained in this alpha variety V, what happens is that this complete curve must, everything stays in the project space, must intersect any hyperplane H at uh, some non empty set of points. Then you have to remove this intersection point with H. But if you remove it because I'm taking the complement of H, that means you remove some points in C from V, then the remaining curve cannot be complete. So the picture is the following. So suppose I have a project space Pn. So I have some hyperplane H here. So the claim is any complete algebraic curve inside Pn must intersect H at some non set of points. And because I'm taking the complement of this hyperplane, so that means I cannot have a complete curve sitting in the complement here. Then C and H, the intersection is not empty. I mean, this is sort of intuitive, right? Because you have this hyperplane in the project space, you have a complete curve, and, yeah, and the intersect number defines the degree of the curve. You cannot have a degree zero actual algebra curve sitting in a project space, if you prefer. Okay, so this brings a uh, the question of the title. Now I have defined affinity in two contexts. So alpha and universal manifolds arising from technical dynamics. Then I define for you alpha varieties arising from geometry. So a few years ago, when I wrote a survey paper introducing technical dynamics to F geometers, I added a remark saying, OK, alpha and universal manifolds, here affinity stands for this local linear structure, which is not what it usually means in our geometry. But later on, I thought about it. So why not these two notions somehow coincide in this context? That would be great, right? <laughs> so yeah, so that's one of the motivations I asked and studied this question. Okay. OK, let me show you this is not a crazy question. We have some evidence. 
So evidence from two types of alpha neuron submanifold, exactly the two types I introduced earlier. First of all, as you know, technical curves are they are never like a complete curve. Right? So you can apply the GL2 action to make the underlying surface breaks or zero merge. And they always hit if you take the true Zarisi closures, they always hit the boundary of the modular space. Um, so if you have a like a if it's not a complete curve, that means you have the completion and removing a non-p set of points, like the cups of the technical curve. So the remaining part, certainly, as I mentioned, a uh, punctured algebra curve is always alpha. Okay. The technical curves are not complete, so they are alpha curves. And you go to a higher dimension, you can consider the other example I mentioned, the torus carvings, but with more than one branch point. So you suppose you put n branch point, you get the complex n-dimensional Hurry space parameterizing branch cover of any toroid with n branch points. And if you just consider not branch cover, just say torus with n branch point. And that is a modular space. So m1n, where the first one denotes the genus, so genus one toroid. And I have additional n like ordinary points because there's no branch cover. So first of all, it's not true that this modular space, m1n, just n pointed Right. This modular space itself is an alpha variety. Because you can study its de Montfort communication. So M1 bar by throwing in the stable nodal Riemann surfaces with N markings. And it shows that on the boundary of the de Montfort space actually supports the uh, hyperplane in the sense of uh, like an ample divisor. Then the interior is just the total space, which is projective variety minus this hyperplane. So by definition, the interior is an alpha variety. And to show that the boundary supports a very ample divisor or supports a hyperplane section, that requires a little bit of work in the geometry, but not too much. And then once you have this, so what are these Hurry spaces? So Hurry spaces just means you get, uh, for each fixed torus with fixed end markings, you get finite many these covers, right? So Hurry space itself also is a finite cover over M1N, because for each fixed torus and, and fixed branch points, you get finite many such covers. These covers vary when you vary the tori, when you vary the markings. So the Hurry space themselves are also finite covers of M1N, and this affinity actually is preserved under finite morphism. If you have finite morphism between two varieties, if downstairs you have a other variety, you can just pull back your boundary or your hyper plane to upstairs, it remains to be something as a hyperplane. So that tells us, as a consequence, all Hurry space of torus carving is alpha. It's following from the affinity of the genus one case. Okay. So these are just two, I guess, typical types of alpha universal manifolds. I mean, if you give me a primitive one, I guess most of them are in low genus. You can just check them by hand. Okay. All right. So. Let me say another remark. So it's, it sounds like because we don't know a complete classification of alpha neuron manifold, how do we study such question? Right? Because we don't know I mean, how many are there. Maybe there are many, many, and you just cannot check it one by one. But you can reduce, if you believe the question has an affirmative answer, then you can reduce it to study the affinity of the ambient structure only. Because of the following remark. First, this is another fact in our geometry. Let me just state it without. Uh, saying anything about proof. If you have an alpha variety and you have a closed subset in the sense under the Zarisic to topology, so you have a closed subset of an alpha variety, then this closed subset itself must be alpha. Okay, so this is some general fact in yeah, geometry. Let's just, uh, let's just assume it. And then the second thing that let's recall Simeon's result, which tells us this alpha inner sign manifold. They are not only these orbit closures under analytic topology, but they are also this algebraically closed subset in the strata. Right? They are this every variety sitting inside the strata. So in other words, alpha and universal manifolds, they are, in the algebraic sense, closed subsets in the ambient strata. So if I know the strata itself is alpha, I just combine the first two remarks. It follows that all alpha and universal manifolds contained in the strata would be alpha. In other words, if you can show me, Say H mu is alpha. Say every alpha in the manifold inside H mu is alpha because they are closed subsets, and closed subset of alpha variety, they are alpha. 
And so I checked a few strata, especially the hyperlytic ones and uh, some strata in low genus, for example, I, mean, I don't know, H4, H31. I mean, it's very low. I couldn't really do even completely in genus 4. But so far, those I checked, the, they are alpha. Okay. Yeah, so low genus strata and hyperlytic strata, they are alpha. Okay. Any questions? Which low genes are So genes two is okay because they are hyperlytic. And genes three, I checked <coughs> uh, several of them. But I had a paper you can um, look at what strat I checked. So yeah, not too many. We were only checking total four or five strata or strata components. Okay. Can you remind us when modify space MT itself is happening? Um, most starting from genes three and higher, they are not alpha. I'm com yeah, I will mention this soon. Okay. For a good reason. Yeah. Yeah. Genes two is hyperly thick, it's alpha. And three and beyond, they are not alpha. I, I'm going to explain that. Any other question? Okay. So Kurt question led to the next topic. So there is a closely related uh, study for this affinity. So I mentioned earlier the picture of the board. I said, if you have an alpha variety, then it cannot contain any complete algebraic curve. So conversely, if you give me a complete curve containing a strata that already answers the question negatively, that tells you the strata cannot be affine because it contains a complete curve. Right? So the close related question is the following. Let's study complete curves, or in general, complete subvarieties in the strata. If that serves as a test one, if you find one, then tells you the strata is not alpha. So then we should really come back to Kurt's question. So first study, what happens in the modular space of curves, MG? So more than 30 years ago, Diaz, I guess the first student of Joe Harris, he proved that any complete subvariety of the modular space of genus G curves, well, they could exist. But if they exist, the complex dimension of this complete subvariety is bounded above by the genus minus two. So let's apply to low genus. For example, in, in case of genus two, that means you cannot find complete curve. Two minus two is zero, you can find points. Points, certainly you can have points, right? But in M3, we do know that M3 contains complete curve. That already tells you M3 is not alpha. And starting from genus bigger than three, you can show they all contain complete curve. So that shows M G bar, sorry, M G, when G is bigger than two, they are always not alpha. Okay. They are not close, but still they are not alpha. So there's something in between. And I have to say that this bond, we don't know whether this bond is sharp for genus four and beyond. Even for genus four, I don't know whether the modular space of genus four curves actually contain the complete algebraic surface. In other words, can you find a complex two-dimensional algebraic surface content, a complete algebraic surface content in the modular space of genus four curves? That question has been open for many years. Yeah. Is it hard to describe the complete algebraic curve in M3? Um, it's easy to describe it uh, abstractly. It's not easy to describe it effectively. So the correct way to show the existence is that one way to do it is that you use the Jacobian map or the so-called Torelli map. You take a smooth curve, you associate it to the Jacobian of the curve. That maps M3 to the uh, A3, the Abinian variety. Okay. Um, then you look at the Dunley Mumford modular convocation, then you extend this uh, the map. Then it turns out you take the closure of M3 inside. A3 under some suitable convocation there called static convocation, then M3 has a somehow co dimension 2 boundary as a closure inside the static convocation of A3. If you have a complex co dimension 2 boundary, you can take some general hypersurface there to cut out a complete curve to, avo to avoid that co dimension 2 boundary. The thing is, if you can give a good convocation so that the boundaries are co dimension 2 or higher, then you are good to find complete curve. So this is an abstract to say. And uh, maybe effective ways, you might want to do some causal fabrication to construct those complete scenes. 
but those maybe goes very, not this bound, but usually goes very high. Okay, but in any case, so if you can find a complete algebra surface in M4, that would be great. Yeah, so that's an open question, pretty difficult in algebra. Okay, so let's ask the analogous question to the strata. So what about complete subvarieties, or in particular, complete curves inside the strata H mu? Okay. So I already told you the remark. So this serves a purpose as a test. If you can find a complete curve in the strata H mu, that tells you the strata is not up. Okay. Well, so I don't have a complete answer to this question. I will tell you a partial answer. But this partial answer depends on two generalizations of Abelian differentials. So let me first come to the generalization of Abelian differentials. So far, everything I said can be generalized naturally in two ways. Okay, I want to generalize Abelian differential. In what sense? First, you don't always have to consider a holomorphic differential. You may consider a differential with poles, meromorphic differential. Okay. In other words, you write down f this, f z d z. There's no need to for f to be holomorphic. You can take a meromorphic function f z times d z. Well, you may wonder. So, what does a, a pole do for us? Well, I mean, these poles correspond to really points at infinity under the flat geometric representation of your differential. In other words, you wouldn't see a finite area flat surface if you have a pole for a being differential. Uh, but on the other hand, this pole just says at infinity, you will get a surface still on, with a flat structure, but then it has infinite area. So there are some special poles at infinity. Okay, I'll show you a picture soon. But before I do that, let me tell you the other way to generalize a being differential. What is a being differential? It's a one form, right? That's at z times dz. You could also do quadratic differentials, right? That is f z d z square. But if you do quadratic differentials, why don't you do cubic differentials, quartic differentials, I don't know, quantic differentials? So let's start a k differentials for any positive integer k. So locally, again, so I can write a k differential very easily as some even possible meromorphic function f z times d z raised to the k, satisfying the change of corners. Again, the question is, why do you study k differentials? Well, as you can already get the answer for quadratic differentials in the case k equal to 2, in general, k differentials belong to, I call it, one k translation structure. If k is 1, that is Abelian differential, you identify your edges by translation. Right? There's no rotation except rotation of 2 pi, of multiple of 2 pi. If you do k equal to 2, so one half transition surface. That's exactly the name for a quadratic differential. Why? You identify edges by positive rotation of multiple of pi, not only two pi. And you do cubic differential. One third transition surface. That means you do the rotation up to multiple of angles two pi divided by three, 120 degree. And they naturally exist. For example, if you take a surface cube, okay, the surface of a cube. It looks like still flat, right? <laughs> but that corresponds to, I think, a quartic differential on the Riemann sphere with poles, if you think about it. Okay. All right, so let me show you more pictures to justify the claim these objects show up naturally. Okay. In particular, this differential with poles show up in the context of degeneration, even if you are only interested in holomorphic objects if you degenerate your holomorphic differential. And uh, if we want to get more information about the degeneration of the underlying Riemann surface along with the limit position of the zeros, and you necessarily have to study meromorphic differential. So here's a picture. So let me explain. The so left-hand side is uh, actually is a holomorphic differential corresponding to um, a differential with a double zero labeled by these blue vertices in the inner parallelogram Z, I removed. So I'm look, only looking at uh, sorry, the complement of Z in Y. So in other words, Y itself is a bigger flat torus. I take away a smaller flat torus Z from Y. The remaining part, I claim, gives you a flat surface in H2, since two 
um, with a differential with zero. Now I take this flat surface on the left. I do the following deterioration. What I can do is I can shrink the inner parallelogram Z. I removed arbitrary small, essentially to a point. Well, this is a valid deterioration. Okay. And if you look at the upper right picture, you just shrink Z to a point. What do you get? You just get a flat torus with a point. Right? That's it. But now you compare the genus. On the left, I told you, you can check that. The complement of Z in Y gives you the genus 2 Riemann surface. The angle at the vertex is still 6 pi because you have to count it outward. This is still octagon in a sense with four pairs of parallel edges on the left. So it's a valid genus 2 flat surface. But now you shrink Z to a point, you get flat torus of genus 1. Maybe it's OK to you, but to me, I'd like to preserve the genus. I don't like the genus to jump down from 2 to 1. For example, it's not valid in the Denis Montfort sense. You should get uh, the genus to be the same. On the way to recover the missing part, you are missing something, right? Because you, you lose your <laughs> one for genus. I mean, you, from the relative point of view, when you say that I shrink Z, if you stand inside Z, you don't realize Z is shrinking. To you is that Y is expanding. So I can also describe it for from the lower right picture. I can expand Y up to large. I keep Z. So what you get is this removed parallelogram sitting in a Euclidean plane. All I need to do is I need to add a point at infinity, and it, it explains this picture as a meromorphic differential, big disk removing the parallelogram as a meromorphic differential on another torus with a double zero as a blue vertices and a double pole at infinity. And moreover, if you draw this picture as an algebraic picture, I think I still have five minutes, so enough time for me. So let's do it. So the generation becomes, well, this is your flat torus y, or you are missing another one. I claim you're, you are missing another torus z, which is sort of also flat, but it's not finite area. So you have two special points. The blue point, that is the degeneration of your original double zero, is still there. And you have a special point that you need to attach to y. Let's call this point, we call this point q, so it's point p. And I claim what will happen is that you have a differential omega on z such that the zero of this differential on z is two times q. And the pole of the differential is two times the attaching point p. In particular, it tells you the limit position of q and p. They cannot be arbitrary points in the torus z because they have to be two torsion to each other. 2p minus 2q gives you the Meromorphic differential on the torus. No, they are two torsion to each other. But that's what I mean. You recover some more information from this generation picture by using meromorphic differential. I mean, it's very natural. OK. So k differentials. I mean, if you study quadratic differentials, one way to study it, you pass to the so-called canonical double cover to lift your quadratic differential via special double cover so that the lift becomes the square of our ability differential. And then you can transform your study to, say, if you want, the study of abelian differentials upstairs. So here the same thing happens for any k differential. You can still perform the operation of canonical k covers. So here is a cubic differential on the left. So I take two slate construction, and then you have to glue the edges by translation and rotation up to degree like uh, 2 pi over 3 in this case. But the upshot is that you can perform a triple cover on the right, so that on the right is an honest abelian differential, where you pull back your cubic differential by this triple cover, then the right-hand side abelian differential, you get yeah, the cubic power of the abelian differential on the right. So this is a canonical triple cover. Okay. So that's why I mentioned this k differentials also show up naturally, okay. for example, in the context of canonical k covers. All right, so let me just wrap up the talk by showing the result and uh, give you a short explanation. 
OK, so I, now I really want to put everything in this generalized context. I want to study meromorphic k differentials so that I have to fix uh, the new signature. So these are integers mi. They could be 0, could be negative. That's fine. Sum up to k times 2d minus 2, k is any positive integer, 1, 2, 3, you like. And some mi's I mentioned could be non positive. That's OK. So I define the new strata, h upper k mu, parameterizing possibly meromorphic k differential of signature mu. Okay. So what I can do is that let's ask how about complete sub varieties in this strata h k mu for k, any k and any mu. I mean, I can only answer this question if you give me a pole in the sense that the pole has enough pole order. Okay, here's the theorem. If this signature mu contains some entry mi, which is negative, and the pole order has to be at least k, where k is, this is k different or k, OK? In other words, if you have an abelian differential, I only need uh, one pole. If you have a quadratic differential, I need uh, two poles in the sense that the flat surface is not of finite area. I need a pole of order at least two for the quadratic differential. So on. Then whenever I have this special entry smaller than or equal to minus k, then I can show that this strata hk mu does not contain any complete area curve. And in particular, let's specialize to the case k equal to 1 just for abelian differential. If I have a strictly meromorphic abelian differential, that means if k equal to 1, I just need one pole of any arbitrary order. Then it does not contain any complete curve. Okay. The proof is, <coughs> let me just use this one slide to explain the proof. What do you mean by stick, right? Stick Say that again? That means I need at least one pole. At least one. Yeah. So sometimes you see meromorphic, it could be meromorphic or holomorphic, right? Yeah, I mean really meromorphic. Okay. I need one mi to be at least minus one. In other words, it does not answer the question for holomorphic differential, but it answers the question if you give me a pole. Two poles are fine, three poles are fine. At least I need at least one pole. I explain why I need it right now. Okay, it's so the last minute. So this proof is short. Let me just do it for the case of meromorphic abelian differentials. That's k equal to one with at least one pole. So let's prove by showing contradiction. Suppose I had a complete algebraic curve B facing the strata of meromorphic abelian differential. And look at the universal curve C over B. B here is the strata. I'll take the universal family of the. Everything is smooth, right? I mean, it's OK. And I have a bunch of special points in the universal curve right, corresponding those to these n zeros or poles, right? And the varies also in the family, this gives me sections S1 and S. So each one is just a flat surface with these n zeros of poles. Sorry, I draw curves for different surfaces. OK, the really the upshot is that there's a relation of holomorphic Lamb bundle classes on this universal curve. Hi. So without writing down, let me just quickly just say it in words. This omega pi is a so-called relative cotangent line bundle. This O minus 1 is the tautological line bundle of the Hodge bundle, which, whose fiber is just given by the differential you parameterize. You have a differential omega and here, parameterizing the space. So it takes the tautological line bundle corresponding to that differential. It's scary. That gives you the fiber of O minus 1. But if O minus 1 stays in the hot bundle, I pull it back so that it stays in the total universal family. And I'm going to compare these two. Because this is differential. Differentials are just sections of the uh, uh, cotangent Lamb bundle of your Riemann surface, right? And you compare with the fiber, <laughs> the cotangent Lamb bundle. I mean, not, notice that the differentials, at some special point here, it may have a 0 or pole, right? If you have a zero, you cannot use the zero to generate uh, like a one-dimensional fiber. It remains zero. So you have to correct it by throwing in those zero or post section. And also, you know the zeros may have higher order. You have to take the multiplicity into account. In any case, if you do it, think about it. You get the relation between Lamb bundle classes. And as a consequence, you can show that so B is an algebraic curve. I can use the Lamb bundle relation uh, do something and uh, reduce it to B 
So that this tautological unbounded class has degree equal to the signature mi plus 1 times the degree of the so-called psi bound on b, where psi i is a sort of the cotangent uh, lamp bound on associated to each i zero pole. Okay. Which is also the psi class that shows in the, I don't know, written conjecture and uh, you may have seen or have heard before. Anyway, so let me not explain it anymore. So the punchline that now my assumption tells me I have some I, I'm I positive and negative. So this mi plus 1 can be positive and negative. And if I have this, but their product has to be the same. If you think a little bit, that really forces the degree of this i has to be 0. You have 0 times positive, 0 times negative, you get the same number. There's only possibility. But this psi bundle itself is a very special line bundle if you think about from the MTN, this modular space of genus G curves with these N markings. The psi bundle has some positivity behavior. In other words, if you have a curve inside MTN and you restrict psi i to it, then this psi i has to have a positive degree. That's a non-trivial fact in our geometry. You have to prove it, but let's use it. But then I just get a contradiction. I know this psi has some positivity property. But then from the above analysis, I know that degree of psi i is 0. It restricts to b, this complete curve, I get 0. How come? That tells you my curve b cannot parameterize a true one-dimensional family. It must give me the constant family. That means b maps to a point in your strut. But that's a contradiction. So it's a short proof using the positivity of the psi class and the, some sign difference of the signatures. That's where I need a pole so that mi plus 1 can have different signs. In general, I will have mi plus k if I do k differential. So I, I need mi plus k to be sometimes positive or negative. That's why I need the order k pole. All right, so I still cannot answer the question for holomorphic differential. So I don't know whether holomorphic differential strata contains or not any complete every curve. So I leave it as a question to you. Okay, I'm done.